Welcome back to another Passage Breakdown. My name's John, and today we're going to be looking at the AAMC FLA 5, the new practice exam, Biology and Biochemistry section, passage number 5. So let's go ahead and jump right in. We're going to be talking about cholera, everybody's favorite topic. Okay, so cholera is an acute diarrheal disease. You didn't know that there were diarrheal diseases, did you? Well, this is one of them, and it's caused by an infection of the intestines with gram-negative motile bacterium Vibrio cholera. Okay, so there's two things there that are high yield sciences that you need to know for the MCAT. One of them is that what a gram negative is, you know, the fact that it has a thin peptidoglycan wall and bacterium. Okay, so after colonizing the small intestine, um, V. cholera secretes cholera toxin, CTX, a protein that ribosylates the GS alpha subunit of the G proteins. G proteins, that's a high yield science, right? G proteins, how they work, they're coupled receptors and that inhibits its GTPase activity. So that's kind of a big relationship there. So let's go ahead and draw that out. We see that our cholera toxin, uh, once it gets into the small intestine, ends up ribosylating, leads to a decrease or inhibits the activity of GTPase. And reading on it says that causes a dysregulation in the chloride ion channel, resulting in efflux of ions and water from the infective enterocytes into the intestinal lumen. So you get ions in water, and one thing that you'll learn in your GI block is where ions go, water follows, which equals diarrhea. So that's kind of how you get diarrhea from cholera. So studies have implicated sodium bioenergetics, whatever that is, in the pathogenesis of V. cholera in humans. An electrochemical gradient of sodium known as the sodium motive force provides cholera with the energy for key functions, Okay, so I'm just going to make a note of this because it's weird. So I have SMF is equal to the energy. So that's the energy for this. So sometimes I'll make a note of things and then I'll go back and put them where they belong in the flow chart. The gradient is predominantly established by sodium pumping NADH um, quinone oxidoreductase, which they're going to call sodium NQR enzyme. Sodium NQR is a multi-substrate enzyme, so enzymes that's high yield. Substrates comprised of six distinct subunits, which are in table one, that are encoded within the same operon. Operon's high yield science. In a process similar to proton pumping by complex one, proton pumping, complex one of the electron transport chain, sodium NQR couples the movement of electrons from, uh, okay, so this makes sense now. So what they're saying is that to do all of this stuff, you have to actually have energy. And that energy is going to come from the sodium motive force. And that is due to this sodium NQR. So this pumping out of, NA, uh, of NADH, similar to the proton pumping in the electron transport chain, is how we get this energy. So this gives us the energy. The energy allows us to make humans poop. That's pretty much what they're saying. So then we go on to table one. Remember how we read tables? We don't. We just read this. We read the caption, which is the biochemical features of cholera, sodium, and QR subunits. And then we read the axes. So we have property and we have all these different subunits. And then we have some things about the subunits. So how many amino acid residues there are, their weight in Daltons or kilodaltons, their isoelectric point, and the number of helices. So there's a lot of different routes they could go here. Researchers investigated the kinetic features. I'm always interested in highlighting the word kinetic because they will test you on kinetics frequently, but where they really, really will trip you up is they'll test you on kinetics, but they'll give an answer choice in equilibrium and try to make you think they're the same thing, and they're just not. So don't fall for that. Make sure you know when you're talking about kinetics versus when you're talking about equilibrium. Kinetics says speed of the reaction, equilibrium is kind of like how much. So figure one shows a double reciprocal plot of one over V naught versus one over concentration of one substrate in ADH at three different concentrations of the second substrate quinone. Reactions were performed in conditions where sodium chloride was saturating. So this kind of looks like a line weaver, a line weaver Burke plot here. I don't know that it necessarily is, but this kind of looks like that's what they're talking about. So we'll read this caption. Double reciprocal plot, this enzyme activity at three different concentrations of quinone. So this is showing how the enzyme responds to different concentrations of quinone. Is it faster with less? Is it slower with more? So that's kind of the passage. Let's go ahead and take a look at the questions. Start with number 25. It says, based on the info pre presented in table one, which is the one we ignore, which relationship between pH and charged functional groups is accurate? Okay, so this is kind of a good example for why I ignore them. I ignore them because now 
this is telling me what to actually look at. If we're talking about pH charged functional groups, then I am only concerned with this isoelectric point. It's good that we read the axis so we know now exactly where to go to, but weight is not gonna tell me about pH, right? Neither is the number of amino acid residues. You might could reach here and get a decent understanding of whether something is polar or nonpolar, but probably not. So we're really focused on PI here because they're asking about pH. And remember the isoelectric point is the point to where like 50% of a molecule is deprotonated and 50% is protonated. So answer A says at pH 8.5, the ratio of cationic, which would be protonated to anionic, which could possibly be deprotonated functional groups in the NQRD subunit is equal to one. Now, not all cations or anions are protonated or deprotonated. So don't take what I said to the bank. But regardless, they're saying at pH 8.5, this subunit is equal to one. So protonated to deprotonated is equal to one, which would be a 50-50 ratio. So NQRD, that is this one right here. What is the PI? 8.5. So that kind of makes sense, right? At 8.5, I would have 50% deprotonated to 50% protonated, which would be a ratio of one. So I like answer choice A. B says at pH 7, half of the functional groups for E. So Actually, for this one, because the PI is 5.3, then this means we're going over the PI, so we would actually have more than 50% deprotonated. So maybe not B, and you can go on through this list and you can knock out the rest of them. pH 6.3, the net charge of NQRA is equal to one. If you go to NQRA, you have 6.3, and it's asking about the net charge here. So you might can get a good picture of the relative functional groups, but not necessarily the net charge because you don't know the charges as a whole for what we're working with. You could have 10 molecules that are positively charged, but their PI is, you know, like 7.1, and then you could have a one molecule that's negatively charged whose PI is like one, and it would bring the total PI of the molecule down to somewhere between one and seven. But the majority of the charges would be positive above seven. So this one's incorrect because they're, fo they're focusing on net charge rather than a ratio. And then D says at pH of six, the majority of the functional groups in NQRF are protonated. Um, so that's F. So F is here. They said at pH six, the majority are protonated. Our PI is under this. Remember PI, if we're going above it, then we're removing a proton. So the majority are actually deprotonated. So the correct answer here is A. Number next is, what is the most likely effect of adding a sodium ionophore to a culture of cholera? So what does an ionophore do is kind of the gateway to entry of this question. An ionophore is going to be something that allows something to pass smoother through a membrane. So I'm going to rephrase this as, what happens if we chunk out like all the sodium? Is that going to decrease the activity of our enzyme? Okay, well, does our enzyme rely on sodium? No, our enzyme is going to produce the sodium. Okay, let's look at number 26 now. It says, what is the most likely effect of adding a sodium ionophore to a culture of V cholera? Okay, so it's important to first note what ionophore means. So an ionophore is going to be something that allows the molecule it's referencing, like sodium here, for example, to go through a membrane. So I'm going to rephrase this as, what happens if we don't have a ton of sodium? What happens if we can't establish a sodium gradient? So A says it would decrease the activity of this enzyme. Well, I'm not saying that we would completely remove the sodium. I would, I'm saying that we, we can't establish a gradient. So say, for example, that the way that this enzyme works, we'll say this boxes the enzymes, it takes sodium, and what it ends up doing is it just kind of like pumps it through. Well, if we have an ionophore, then what we're going to end up doing is we're just going to have a hole. So regardless how many sodiums we pump through, then they can just come back through, okay? So this enzyme is not slowed down by any means. It's still being very active. It's just we can't establish a gradient. So if we can't establish that gradient, and we're not gonna decrease the activity. What we're gonna decrease is the ability to produce ATP. You can get to this by asking yourself about the electron transport chain because that's what the passage made a good parallel to. So imagine, for example, if you were to poke a hole in the electron transport chain that allowed the hydrogen ions to come back through the molecule. If you can't establish a hydrogen ion gradient, well then you can't have a gradient large enough to crank the ATP synthase. So that's going to lead to decreased production of ATP. So I like B. C says decreasing the pH of the periplasm. Well, maybe that would be true for the electron transport chain, but here we're talking about moving sodiums, and sodiums are not impacting pH. Not directly. So maybe not C. 
And then D says decreasing the consumption of oxygen. Well, oxygen is going to be a virtue of activity. And so we're not decreasing the consumption of oxygen. Again, we're not told that that is like the final electron acceptor like we would be with the electron transport chain. And oxygen is just not really talked about a whole lot in this passage. So it would not be good to draw that parallel. So maybe not to D. Correct answer here would be B. Again, they talked about the sodium being directly linked to energy. So that's why it's okay to make this parallel or this leap to ATP, but they did not talk about oxygen as being the final electron acceptor, so it's not okay to make that leap. Number next is which two subunits of sodium NQR can be separated by gel filtration, but not by ion exchange chromatography, okay? So how do these things separate? Gel filtration can separate by mass, ion exchange can separate by charge. So we're gonna say which of these is very close or identical in charge, but pretty different in mass. Let's go and look. So we have the two that are closest in charge. We're probably looking at these two. And then are they pretty different in mass? Well, yeah, one is literally double the size of the other. So let's see if we have an answer choice for E and F. And in fact, we do. So I won't go through all those because that one's pretty straightforward. But that's the difficult part is rephrasing that question just like most of the MCAT. And number last is which enzyme of the citric acid cycle is not directly involved in generation of the dinucleotide required for the activity here. Okay, so what is the dinucleotide required for this activity? Well, what does it tell us is required? Even if you don't know what a dinucleotide is, what is required for this enzyme? Okay, it says we require sodium, NADH, and then quinone oxidoreductase. Okay, so which of these sounds more like a nucleotide? Sodium is an ion, quinone oxidoreductase, that's obviously some kind of protein or enzyme, and then NADH, which is like nicotinamide or something like that, that is a dinucleotide. So now we're rephrasing this question as which of these enzymes in the citric acid cycle is not directly involved in taking NAD plus and making it NADH? Well, if you know like whatever mnemonic you use, I think Maggie uses one like, I can't remember it. I only have the dirty ones remembered but you can use one like, can I keep selling sex for money officer and fill in the blanks for which those mnemonics mean. But something that I do have memorized is, even though I don't have all of the steps memorized that crank out NADH, I do have the ones memorized that do very specific things. Like I know that succinate to fumarate makes FADH. And so that is going to be the correct answer here is answer choice B. So this one's actually pretty much a straight knowledge one, but you don't have to necessarily memorize all of the ones that make NADH to get this one correct. You just need to know the one that does something different. Um, so that's how I got to answer choice B here is because I knew that succinate to fumarate, which is what succinate dehydrogenase would make, would make FADH. So the correct answer here is B. Nice and easy passage. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. Check out the links in the description. I think you'll find something there that's helpful to you and I will see you in the next one.